Good morning, everyone. Um, I've got a bit of a cold, so apologies for that. I'm glad I have the mic. I'm delighted to be here, too. I studied here at SOAS for two years in the 90s, learning to read and write Urdu and Hindi, and I have very fond memories. And I'm also very happy that uh, Valerie Amos uh, has, has joined here, not least as, as with Trevor, she was a uh, trustee of the Runny Me Trust, I believe, in the late 90s. Um, this is who Runny Mead is. Runny Mead is actually a, a race equality think tank. I just want to uh, put that up front so you understand that's the sort of perspective of my presentation. I will, of course, be talking about British Muslims, but I'm going to be putting that in a wider context, I think, similarly to, to what you've just heard from Trevor, and I think uh, some similar uh, findings. We're, we, t we are an independent think tank, and we do tend to focus on research and analysis. But as with this conference, and as Trevor just has suggested, we try to link that research to practical uh, policy recommendations in the real world. I think the first question we need to ask is what do we mean by integration? Um, I'm going to argue that we should think of integration in terms of different domains. And I'm going to compare uh, briefly uh, uh, a government, that's a government department, communities and local government, produced an integration strategy last year. And I'm going to try to highlight what I mean by different domains by analyzing their strategy briefly. I think we need to think about which groups are we talking about, and I, th I think, again, we've already heard a bit about this, but my key, I suppose, argument here is that we shouldn't just look at Muslims, nor should we only look at minorities. And I think the final question is, how do we measure? And I think we, we don't really have uh, an agreed answer on that one. Um, I did want to give you summaries of the citizenship survey because it's the best sort of quantitative data set that we have on these sorts of questions. And in that survey, 90% of Muslims and also Hindu Sikhs and ethnic minority Christians report a strong sense of personal belonging to Britain. Muslims across a variety of ethnicities are more likely to report feeling British than were, for example, Caribbean Christians. The strength of this sense of Britishness was associated with age, gender, and place of birth, uh, but also race, risk of racist victimization. So this is, a, I think, an important finding in the literature that is not just in the citizenship survey, but you see in EMBES, which is the Ethnic Minority British Election Study, um, where those groups that report uh, an experience of, of racist discrimination are less likely to feel, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, British. Uh, the final point here is you, how you feel about yourself in the world is, of course, about your own personal resources and identity and how you want to navigate the world. But the sense of your identity and how it's legitimated by others and accepted by others is of course, accepted by the responses of others in wider society. So for example, when Tiger Woods said that he was a Kablan Asian, because he was part Caucasian, part black, part, part Asian, um, it's not clear to me that that is indeed the way in which uh, American society views Tiger Woods. So what do I mean by different domains? I'm going to just briefly talk about the, commu uh, the communities and local government, uh, government integration strategy, which was in the last coalition government. And they identified they called it one uh, integration process, but we disaggregated it on the five um, areas that they talked about. And these areas were common ground, and those common ground measures were shared aspirations and values, focusing on commonalities rather than differences. Responsibility, which was a sense of mutual commitments and obligation. Social mobility, uh, participation and empowerment, and tackling intolerance and extremism. So in a, in a positive sense, I think the government there is recognizing that there are different elements within integration. And I think that's a positive thing. I think, unfortunately, they still did tie them all together and implied in their strategy that all groups are sort of moving positively or negatively in one direction on all these domains. We looked at some of the actual indicators that you might use from the citizenship survey, and I don't have time to go through all of the findings. But effectively, we did find, in general, positive findings for all groups on most of these domains. But we did also find differences, and those differences weren't always about ethnicity, in fact. They were about migrant, uh, uh, whether you are a migrant or not. So that, that led us to reflect, and we're still working on this, about perhaps rather than thinking of one single process of integration that's linear and that all groups are experiencing equally and at the same time and at the same rate, we should rather think of domains of integration. And some possibilities are residential, socioeconomic, participation, political, cultural, or the, the sort of th uh, things also that Trevor was just speaking about, and of course, interpersonal. And we might think that some of things, these things matter more than others. Um, I'm just going to go through some of the data on some of those measures. So I just mentioned national identity. This is the data for the census on how different ethnic groups uh, feel about their national identity. 
Uh, and one of the most, I suppose, striking findings is that the, the groups with the highest number of Muslims, Pakistanis, and Bangladeshis are most likely to identify only as British. And most of them have a very small proportion who identify uh, as foreign. And almost all of those, of course, are born overseas. I think we have to be careful in interpreting these data. A lot of people look at this, and you, you hear that uh, British Muslims are more likely to affirm the British identity than white British people. And if you see the third bar down, that is indeed true. So less than 20%, 15% or so of white British people uh, have a British identity only. But that's because most of them identify as English. That's that orange bar. So we're looking at the third bar down, the white British bar, and we see that white British people are much more likely to identify as English. Whether or not that matters, I think, is an interesting question, but it will become, I think, more interesting if and when Scotland becomes independent. Uh, here are the data by religion, and again, you can see uh, that there doesn't seem to be a problem in terms of uh, Muslims identifying as British or English. This is a chart from the Center on the Dynamics of Ethnicity at the University of Manchester. This shows more uh, residential patterns of, of separation, an index of, of dissimilarity. Um, and what it shows is between 1991 and 2001, these are three censuses, uh, that for most groups, uh, there's been a decline in, in the level of segregation. So most groups are less segregated today than they were in the past. Uh, and here's the data on religion, and you see the same finding. And this is true not simply because of uh, black and minority ethnic people moving into suburban or rural areas. It's also the case that if you look at the decline in the numbers of black, uh, of black and minority ethnic people, the boroughs where you see the sort of largest uh, outgrowth of, say, Bangladeshis is, for example, Tower Hamlets. The other element of a domain of integration that, again, has already been touched upon is uh, socioeconomic. And we probably do think that whether or not a group is integrated uh, is partly determined by how well they have opportunities in our society, and indeed, the government's own integration strategy highlights that. Here are the data on child poverty. As you can see, all groups uh, have higher rates of child poverty. Those rising to 50% for Pakistani children. Uh, we care about poverty partly because uh, it's bad when people have not enough money, but I think we're particularly concerned about what is called persistent poverty. If you lose your job, uh, you might be in poverty for a few months. But what's more concerning is where you have groups that are persistently in poverty over the course of long periods of time. And here you see that black African and Pakistani groups, uh, and indeed um, Bangladeshi groups and black Caribbean groups, are much more likely to be in poverty persistently. This means po poor in all years of that survey. So for three years in a row, they reported being poor. Here's the data on low pay, pay uh, and wage inequality. I wanted to just briefly note that a lot of the wage inequality is driven by occupational segregation. And I think there's an interesting question, somewhat raised by, I think, already what Trevor has said. You know, why do people congregate in certain kinds of jobs? Um, and some of it may be down to choice, but I don't think all of it is. I don't think, for example, one in three Bangladeshi men in Britain particularly want to be chefs and waiters, even though that is the finding, that one in three Bangladeshi men in Britain want to be chefs and waiters. But at the same time, we do find that a lot of Bangladeshi men, not just those born in Bangladesh, but their children, are uh, becoming chefs and waiters. And we need to ask why that's the case. But it's not only because people are in kind of crap jobs, if we put it that way, and jobs that don't have much uh, opportunities for progression. It's even when people are graduates, they tend to be overqualified. We've also done a briefing on Russell Group graduates where we controlled for degree choice and degree outcome, and we found that black graduates from Russell Group in 2013, so not a long time ago, uh, were more likely to be unemployed six to 12 months following graduation than their white peers. And here, I think this is actually worrying even for the white group, that a fifth of our graduates are doing jobs um, for which they're well overqualified and arguably are not getting the same value out of their fees. And I think this also raises a question for universities. Uh, if they're going to be charging fees, should black students, should Asian students ask are you actually giving us the same return and maybe we should pay a bit less in fees if we're going to get a little less out of our job, out of our, grad, out of our degrees. Uh, another, I said there was another domain, well, many other domains. One other domain we might care about is political participation or participation generally. This is the number of people who are very or fairly dissatisfied with democracy in Britain. And again, I think you can interpret this in different ways, but as you can see there, Pakistani and Bangladeshi groups, that those represent about two-thirds of Muslims today in Britain, are the least dissatisfied with democracy. They look like they think that democracy is working quite well. 
uh, if, and if you were to say to me which group looks least well integrated, you might say the mixed and black Caribbean groups. Now, as I said, I think that's why you have to be somewhat careful. I think it's fair to say that that may be true, that black Caribbean and mixed groups are dissatisfied uh, with democracy and it shows a failure of political integration into the political making process. I think it's also, though, important to note that there's something called migrant optimism in the literature on democracy, which is that people who come from other countries come, come to Britain with a sort of sense that life is better here, whereas their children have higher expectations. And we shouldn't five think that that's a bad thing. Five minutes left. We've got five minutes. Okay, yeah. We shouldn't think that that's a bad thing. It's not a bad thing if the children of migrants say that the parents came from Pakistan where they maybe felt that elections were rigged or they came from Somalia where they felt that the state was uh, not particularly uh, successful. They're, the fact that they have higher expectations than their parents may not be a failure of integration. It might be uh, positive that they have uh, dissatisfaction rates that are similar to their white peers. The other issue that you sometimes hear about is whether or not groups are willing to consider violence as a legitimate means of political protest. And here are the data again. And again, it doesn't really show that Muslim groups have any higher propensity towards thinking that violence is a legitimate form of political action. 15% of white British people think that violence is a legitimate form of political action. 15% of Pakistani people think that violence is a legitimate form, and 17% of Bangladeshi. So again, it doesn't look um, that they're that uh, non-integrated in terms of political values and democracy. Uh, on the distrust of police, again, it's different groups that have dissatisfaction with the state and probably not surprising if you're a young black man who's still disproportionately stopped in search. Although we, I think we should be uh, recognizing that of the few good things that Theresa May has done has been to reduce the use of stop and search. Distrust politicians, you see the same pattern. I think the final kind of data slide I wanted to put up was this, this one, simply because this moves, I think, from socioeconomic and political forms of integration to interpersonal ones. And this is the number of couples in interethnic relationships. And I partly put this up because I recall seeing a school in East London asking its eight-year-olds whether or not they'd be willing to marry someone of a different ethnic background. So I thought I would look into the data in terms of seeing who does marry people from a different ethnic background. And you actually find that the white British group are the least likely to marry someone from a different ethnic background. So if we're going to use that as a measure of integration and extremism, well, it doesn't particularly look uh, like uh, that it's ethnic minorities who, are, who have the, the, the least integration. I think, we, again, we have to be careful in interpreting that. All, all I was trying, all I want to do with this slide is to show, yes, Bangladeshis, Pakistanis, and Indians have lower rates uh, of interethnic relationships than in particular black groups. Um, but whether or not that's a religion thing, I think, is open to question when you look at the fact that white British is low and also that Indian groups have such low rates there as well. Uh, I have already mentioned the fact that how I identify as, my, as a person is partly determined, uh, it, it, it is important, but how others then interpret and affirm my identity is equally important. Uh, Trevor has cited the data from the British Social Attitudes Survey about whether or not you'd be willing to have uh, someone from a different ethnic minority as your boss, and I think he's right to say that uh, while the sort of headline findings of the British Social Attitudes Survey said that there was sort of equivalent levels of racism, if you dig into it, you do see a decline in prejudice on some of these, on, on most of these measures. But the one that I think is worrying is it's not really the case for Muslims. So once you pull out the Muslim group, the percentage of white British people who would mind if a relative married a different ethnic group, it's, it's half. Half of white British people would mind if their relative married a Muslim, and it's less than a quarter for, for the other ethnic minority groups. Oh, my conclusion is completely garbled. Um, okay, so what that's supposed to say is that uh, integration is not a uniform, linear, one-way process. Uh, it has different domains, and um, Runnymede in particular has tended to focus more on the socioeconomic and political domains, but I, I think it's an open question which of those domains we think are most important for crafting the kind of gracious society that Trevor referred to for the future. I think also integration is not just a question for Muslims, it's a question for all majorities, uh, minorities, but also the majority population. 
Um, finally, because it is something that we've written about, and in fact, I think uh, Trevor was at Runnymede when this was the Islamophobia report was produced, I still think that some of the discussion of Islamophobia in that report stands, particularly in terms of thinking of Islam not as a closed, but as an open, uh, in, in, in open ways, and I'm, I'm, I'd be happy to revisit that in the Q&A. But my, my final point, I suppose, is uh, looking at uh, integration, we shouldn't just look at British Muslims, but we should look at all the groups. And this is not simply a question of analysis, it's also a question of, of, of I suppose, politics and civil society action. And I would encourage Muslim groups to work with other black and minority ethnic groups, and indeed those liberal uh, groups in the white majority who are looking to actually do uh, more effective work on integration policy. Thank you. Can I thank you for sticking to your 15 minutes on the dot? And if our other speakers can follow suite, that'd be really grateful. Um, lots of statistics there, lots of thought-provoking information, which I'm sure will open up the question and answer section. Can I now invite um, Osama Hassan from the Quillen Foundation to take the floor? You have his bio in front of you in the booklet. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. So thank you to Professor Abdul Halim, Miriam Francois, and all the team. I'm also honored to speak here at this very important conference. And it was great to listen to Trevor Phillips, because earlier this year, I was honored to watch his documentary, his thought-provoking and perhaps controversial documentary on these issues, in the company of David Goodhart at uh, Ditchley Park. And we had some very interesting conversations there. It's also nice to be on a panel with somebody called Omar, uh, because I can always then crack a joke about a former so-called dream team of Mullah Omar and Osama bin Laden. This is a different dream team of an Omar and Osama. <coughs> Finally, on, um, just before I start, right? On integration, um, Norman Tebet, Lord Tebet, now famously had his cricket test for integration. And uh, on the way here, I, I learned the cricket score this morning. Um, and I, I, I failed the cricket test because I grew up experiencing a lot of racism in this country in the 80s. But my sons all support England. But I can announce to you, you'll be happy or delighted or indifferent that uh, this morning the Pakistan bowlers bowled at England cheaply and won the test match in series. Right, uh, now I'll talk about Islam. This is a Muslim integration uh, conference, so I will uh, refer to Islam, of course. There are a couple of texts from uh, the Quran and the Hadith which <coughs> I think are important to promote mm -hmm. integration, uh, but of course there are many understandings of that term, as uh, I shall outline, as well, as all the social scientists know far better than I do. Uh, Tariq Madud especially, this table, if you've not seen it, I mean, I, I find his writing very interesting. This is his EU-funded paper from 2011. He talks about four modes of integration, so he points out there's no one way to integrate. And he talks about assimilation, individualist integration, cosmopolitanism, which he also calls diversity, and talks about super diversity, and multiculturalism, which he prefers. He, he, these are in an order for him, going from left to right, um, least good to, to best, but he accepts that there are aspects where the others may work. And he says sometimes people call all three of these multiculturalism, but there are different levels. Well, all four, in fact. Some people call multiculturalism, but he, he likes to differentiate. He also, in this table, why I put this table up, he maps them against values. Because I'm going to talk about values. And he talks about th three core values, liberty, equality, fraternity, which sound very French. But uh, Modoud says these are core European democratic values. <coughs> and, and he maps policy uh, regarding these values, objects of policy, um, according to the different modes of integration. I won't go through that because that's his work. You can read that if you're, if you're interested. Mm -hmm. I certainly find it very interesting. What I'm going to concentrate on is those values. Because he says in all cases it is assumed that a backdrop of liberal democratic rights and values are operative to a large degree. Okay, and all the rest is interactions on them. So it is basic rights and values which, which are an issue. We, now, I'm, I'm speaking from the Muslim, a Muslim perspective, brought up in London and being active on the campuses for many years. There are Muslim groups and individuals, there's a whole discussion within Muslim groups around these values. 
There are people who oppose freedom, who say th these are all Western <coughs> ideas. They say freedom and democracy, liberty are Western ideas, and Muslims have to somehow reject or modify them. And sometimes similarly with the other values. I'm actually going to argue that these are understood today core Islamic mm -hmm. values, and therefore Muslims should not uh, have a problem with engaging fully with this discourse, as I presume is the object, one of the objects of this conference. And again, on that, what, here are four types of integration. What's going on here? Uh, this is perfect timing for those who follow EastEnders. Uh, tonight and tomorrow, the other plug, there's going to be a nikah between these two couples. Okay, I can reveal that because uh, they brought me in to consult on this and I spent, <laughs> I spent two days uh, filming with the EastEnders cast. Right? The, this, is, this is a character called Shabnam. She's played by somebody who's not Muslim. Um, Raki Takrar is her name. Uh, th this is Kush. And it's very interesting, here you have a Muslim family who've been around in Eastern for about eight years. Nearly all the actors are not Muslim. And uh, you know, is that a good example of integration? Is it not? Is Citizen Khan a better one? Um, mm -hmm. I asked the actress here, she said she gets very little interaction from Muslim women in terms of writing in. Uh, so, is, and I, my speculation would be that uh, she is not as much a household name amongst British Muslims as is, say, Nadia Hussain who is, of course, a, a real Muslim, if you like, winning the Great British Bake Off recently. But anyway, I think that's a good example. If you're interested, do follow it tonight and, and tomorrow night, or, or catch up, because we'll be at the conference dinner, so not tonight. You know, catch up on iPad. Right, values. Of course, Muslims have a, have a sacred law, a sense of ethos and values, the Sharia. Uh, and what I'm going to argue is that in the past, there were different understandings of these values, which I think can be overcome easily now, but uh, it, it does require a bit of theological jurisprudential work. So for example, liberty, freedom. There is, a, there is this issue about freedom of religion and, ex and expression. Trevor Phillips talked about censorship and offense. There is a famous Quranic verse of no compulsion in religion. With equality, I mean for many people, Islam obviously is a very equal religion, a very egalitarian religion. Many people convert to Islam for that reason, being one of the reasons. Historically, there's no doubt that, for example, women and non-Muslims were treated differently to Muslim men in the Sharia. For example, uh, jizya and dhimma uh, for non-Muslims, and Muslim personal law um, differentiating between men and women on many issues. And those are all part of the discussions around Sharia. And of course, they have, you have proponents and uh, opponents of, of, of various viewpoints in that regard, but it is an issue. In terms of fraternity, or what Maudud calls is civic unity. Uh, there was a sense for some people, that, or many people, that only Muslim Brotherhood counted. The fraternity was only for the Muslim, that's what matters. And in fact, other religious tra traditions probably had that as well. You had the idea of Christendom, or um, with our Jewish friends, of course, a strong sense of uh, uh, religious fraternity. Now, that had political implications. Let's not forget, this is just a, a, a quick summary of that. In classical, if you like, or medieval, pre-modern Islam, you had... The, the earth split up into Darul Islam and Darul Kufr, the land of Islam and land of unbelief. And uh, the latter was split up into lands of peace, where you had a peace treaty, and lands of war. Muslims, uh, non-Muslims, sorry, lived under the protection of Muslim authority here, only if they paid the jizya and had this status of dhimma, protected people. You also had non-Muslim visitors with a safe passage, a man. And Muslim visitors had the same in the... In, uh, even in lands of war. A very primitive system of a visa, if you like, but based on individual guarantee. Now the point is that there are groups, <coughs> organized groups, who still believe in this and wish to bring it back. I mean, ISIS have brought this back. Jizya and Dhimma, they have brought it back. The 7-7 uh, bombers and the murderers of Drummer Lee Rigby, which is where the poppy is, uh, is relevant, um, explicitly talked about this. Lands of Islam, lands of war. Um, etc. and many other groups do that. We're talking about British Muslims, so clearly this is, this is an issue. I did some research on this for, for a report I wrote and uh, I found some interesting things because many people know that basic picture. But if you look at one, Sharisi, one Sharisi's fatwas about Spain and North Africa, Galera is a place near Granada and it was a majority Muslim town taken over by Christians in the 15th century. And there was this big issue, what do the Muslims there do? And there was a scholar called Ibn Asim. In his discussion, he talks about jizya 
as not a religious construct, but as a civic one, because he said Muslims could pay jizya to the Christian rulers and live under their protection, as long as they were not being harmed, etc. So it was fine for Muslims to live under the uh, authority of non-Muslims. And, and that's the new box. I should put that in a different color, really. Then there's uh, Ibn Taymiyyah's famous fatwa about Mardin. There was a new Mardin conference some years ago, and there's been a lot of discussion about this fatwa. It's only one page. It's less than one page. Um, I, I gave my own translation in my report, uh, which is called From Zimma to Democracy. And Ibn Taymiyyah's contribution was to add a new category here, Dar Murakkab which is a compound, a composite land of Islam or unbelief. Mardin was a town in modern-day Turkey. Again, majority Muslim was taken over the Mongol um, armies. So again, the question, how could Muslims live under uh, this non-Muslim authority? And Ibn Taymiyyah said, well, Mardin is neither a land of Islam nor a land of unbelief. It's a mixture, uh, which may seem an obvious answer, but it was actually groundbreaking for that time. In fact, what I found interesting was the situation of Galera happened roughly 150 years after Ibn Taymiyyah and Mardin. But uh, the scholars in North Africa and Spain did not seem to be aware of uh, or hadn't accepted Ibn Taymiyyah's uh, contribution there. And they were still talking in terms of the slightly older framework. Now, that's very different to modern international relations, of course, where you, you have equality in citizenship. Well, this is a very simplistic picture, but uh, you, know, you have lots of nation states and, of course, federations or uh, conglomerations of nation states like the EU, etc. Um, and you have citizens, nationals, you have residents with leave to stay and visitors with visas. And uh, as I said before, you know, th these are the modern equivalents of what we had centuries ago, residents, uh, people paying a special tax and, and, and people with a very simple visa or permission to travel. Uh, but, but this is the, uh, the modern framework. How do we get from this you know, from these to this, which I think is important for Muslims to take their theological and jurisprudential heritage seriously to engage with this issue. Well, for me, one of the obvious answers is the whole theory of maqasid al-Sharia, the universal objective of the Sharia, which is based on holistic reading of the Quran and so not merely individual texts. And this theory was developed by, uh, well, it, for me, it has its roots in the way of the Prophet Muhammad himself very clearly. But it was developed explicitly by people like Juwaini Ghazali, Ibn Abd al-Salam, Qarafi, Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Qayyim, Shaltibi, etc. More recent contributors have been Ibn Ashur, Muhammad Hashim Kamali, and Ibn Bayyah, and that literature is, is very well known. You have five minutes. Thank you. Now, I think that Maqasid al-Sharif, for me, clearly leads to values. The higher objectives of the sacred law uh, can be expressed in values. Uh, and so these are many. The first five are very well known from Ghazali. Faith, life, intellect, property, family, reputations the protection and promotion of these things. Uh, but you see, Ibn Taymiyyah and others added others, uh, other values or higher objectives, protecting communities, morality, honesty, trustworthiness, etc., fundamental rights and liberties, knowledge, education, peace and justice in international relations, the love and worship of God. So, you know, this theory is actually very com comprehensive. It's saying Islam and the Sharia promote all of these things. And uh, that slide looks very modern, but... Uh, uh, those <coughs> ideas were expressed or developed centuries ago. In particular, so I would say, so, you know, responding to Maudud here, liberty, equality, fraternity, or, or, or to the French or American models. Liberty or freedom, which in Arabic we'd call hurriya, is one of these Sharia objectives, according to many authorities, including Gamal al-Banna, who is the younger brother of Hassan al-Banna, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, so Gamal al-Banna wrote, wrote about that extensively. Equality, Musawa, is also arguably a Sharia objective, including women and non-Muslims. There is a worldwide movement by that name, actually, um, led by Muslim women for equality in Muslim personal law. Um, but uh, a civic equality, the sense of equality, including all citizens, including non-Muslims, is, uh, I think, very easily extendable to that. Fraternity, or Ukhuwa, Muslims know about the idea of Muslim Brotherhood, with a small b. Um, but uh, I would argue, again, it's a Sharia objective extended to all of humanity. We have had many uh, Muslim universalists, of course, especially in the Sufi tradition, but uh, outside that as well, uh, who say, well, God's mercy is universal and encompasses everyone and everything, and therefore there is a, a global 
uhuwa, of fraternity, of humanity. And I think ideas like that are very important to, uh, uh, to underpin this discussion. So uh, I've, I've said that. That's my brief conclusion. I've just got some quotes to, to finish off, which is liberty, equality, and fraternity, and other kind of modern Euro uh, democratic values are arguably core, core Islamic values. They're not European or Western. They are part of the human tradition, if you like. And so Muslims have, should have no problem, really, engaging with this kind of discourse, integration discourse, uh, including all the variations that Maudud and others talk about, whilst remaining faithful to their, our religious tradition. Now, th this is not a new uh, conclusion. I'm, not, I'm just going to finish now with a few quotes over the last couple of centuries, and let you read them. I'm not going to read these out. But this is from the uh, Ottoman <coughs> Sultan mm -hmm. Mehmed II. And I think he's, uh, you know, he was moving towards that, influenced by the French Revolution uh, just some decades earlier, possibly. Uh, in 1856, the Ottomans abolished jizya and dhimma. So here they're talking about uh, equality, the civic equality, <coughs> race and religion. There's Muhammad Ali Johar, who's buried in, in Al-Aqsa Mosque, the site. You, you'll have seen it. Those who've gone to Jerusalem, uh, Muhammad Ali Johar, uh, president of the Inter Indian National Congress, 1923, uh, he talks about the dream of the United Faiths of India. He mentioned the United States of America, but talks about the United Faiths of India. Again, the universalist uh, approach to these things. Muhammad Ali Jinnah, famously. I've mentioned India, so I've got to mention Pakistan, uh, especially with the cricket um, relevance. But there we are. This is his famous speech, Qadi uh, Azab Muhammad Ali Jinnah. We're all citizens, equal citizens of one state, um, where the civic aspect is, is not... Uh, equalizes, if you like, the religious differences. You can have religious difference, but uh, the religions cooperate in the public space, basically what he's saying. Here's Sentok, whose uh, work I strongly recommend, where he says the Ottoman Declaration of Regulations may be seen as the first Islamic human rights declaration in the modern sense. And he says the UDHR was supported by Turkish scholars of Islamic law in 1948, who argued it was, in, uh, it was consistent with Islamic principles and was universal. Finally, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayyah, who is contemporary, one of the leading theologians and jurists uh, of today, and he speaks about citizenship in his book, Sinat al Fatwa. Again, I've, I've given uh, a longer translation of what he writes about this in my uh, paper, From Dhimma to Democracy. Uh, but again, he uh, comments on Habermas and endorses this idea of civic society founded on the sharing of basic values. This accords with the understanding of Islam about human coexistence. Uh, for Muslims, there should be no harm in it, uh, but rather we should uh, cooperate and take part. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, We're now moving to David Goodhart, who's from the Integration Hub, and he's going to be addressing you on what does integration look like in a liberal society? Why does it matter? And is there a special Muslim issue with integration? So nothing at all. Um, <clears throat> I must learn how to do these presentation things. They are, they are um, better for the audience, I think. Um, anyway, thank you very much, Ifath. Um, and um, thank you, Zama. What you forgot to mention about the defeated England cricket team is that it does have three British South Asians playing for it at the moment. And indeed, it has two Muslims playing for it, which means that Muslims are grossly overrepresented uh, in the England cricket team at the moment. Um, it's, interestingly, it's not actually the highest number of ethnic minority Brits who have played for England. That was five in the um, January the 2nd test in 1999 against the Australians in Australia. Anyway, cricket anoraks, we can talk about uh, race and cricket later. Um, uh, as... Um, as Trevor mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm the director of the Integration Hub, uh, which is a, a website. To, do go and visit it if you don't know of it. It's integrationhub.net. Um, actually, that's what, I, that's what should be up there. Integrationhub.net. 
uh, what, what we've done, I did it when I was at Demos, although the, the hub is now independent of Demos, is basically pulled together all of the relevant information on issues relating to ethnic minority integration and segregation, divided into five different chapters. Um, we, have a, we have a blog. We very, very much encourage people to um, look at the material, comment uh, as uh, both on the material on the website, but also as, as things happen in the real world and new research comes out, uh, events, dear boy, events. Um, anyway, I, yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, integration uh, in a liberal society, very hard to define, uh, a much, much disputed concept, um, subjective um, and hard to measure. Um, the public conversation about these issues tends to grasp at, at passing events to declare Britain either hopelessly divided, you know, when a British-born Muslim um, um, you know, performs a terrorist act somewhere, or it swings to the other extreme um, and regards us as one big happy family when, for example, the charming British Bangladeshi Nadia Hussein recently won the great British Bake Off. I think mo most people, most of us, do feel um, ambivalent about the whole idea of integration in some ways. We uh, accept um, that people tend to feel more comfortable amongst people that they have been raised amongst, um, people whose language and cultural references and so on they, they um, easily understand. Um, and yet, on the other hand, I think we also grasp that a good society uh, cannot consist of lots of you know, inward-looking tribes, that um, parallel lives, people who have little mutual regard for, for others, is not the basis of a good society. Um, despite all these caveats about it being hard to define, I mean, I think, as Trevor said earlier, uh, I think it is reasonable to see convergence in life chances and to a lesser extent in lived experience between the largest ethnic groups as, as central to the idea of integration in modern Britain. This does not mean that everyone should be converging on lifestyle norms set by the white British majority. In any case, in contemporary society, um, those norms vary very widely. It may indeed be easier to recognize integration by its opposite in the most segregated places. And it should certainly be a cause of concern if some groups are diverging too far, especially in the harder quantifiable outcomes in economic life and educational outcomes. And of course, upward mobility for minorities is much tougher if they're not connected to mainstream networks. I think that's common sense. I think recent decades have seen significant advances, as, as, as we've seen from previous speakers, in the openness of British society and the decline of overt discrimination against minorities. But in some other respects, I think integration has become, if anything, more problematic, more difficult. Perhaps the greater liberalism and individualism of British society means there are fewer national landmarks of shared allegiance to rally around. The scale and speed of recent immigration has also increased ethnic minority concentration in some areas, making it easier to live separate from the mainstream, often reinforced by by modern, modern media globalization, the internet, and so on. And of course, we also have greater choice in schools and other public services these days, um, which makes it less likely that people will have shared experiences. Some degree of ethnic clustering is clearly the norm, uh, especially when minority groups reach a certain critical mass, Polish people in Boston, Lincolnshire, for example, or where group institutions, such as mosques, halal shops, and madrasas for Muslims, draw a minority together. One of the great policy questions of our times is how much separation is compatible with an open and healthily mixed society. It's a question the British state has not been much interested in answering, at least until quite recently. France, um, unlike France, Britain recognizes the existence and significance of ethnic groups, which is why we have the data to talk with some confidence about ethnic group outcomes but it is not, on the whole, regarded it as part of its role to promote ethnic mixing. Policy over recent decades has been rather one of a benign laissez-faire rather than a more interventionist integrationism. 
although that may be starting to change, partly thanks to the response to Islamic extremism. And then it should be. But why, I mean, apart from the historically contingent, or at least we hope historically contingent, issue of extremism, do we worry about integration at all? Are we not all just individual citizens? Well, yes, of course we are. But there is such a thing as society, too. I was at a, a conference recently uh, on the refugee crisis, and uh, there were lots of academics, people working for NGOs, um, government officials. And it was interesting the way that the people, a lot of the people in the room were talking about society. And they were talking like sort of generals moving moving divisions around the map. Uh, people talked about the, the youth boom in the West Balkans or indeed in parts of Africa and the ageing societies of Northern Europe. But wouldn't it be sensible if we just got to move this group and plonk them in this society? Um, anyway, I, I was rather, su rather surprised by this um, really extreme form of individualism. Um, uh, I believe there is such a thing as society. Societies are not just random collections of individuals who happen to live in physical proximity and into which millions of people from elsewhere can be easily transplanted. Successful societies are based on habits of cooperation, familiarity and trust, and on bonds of language, history and culture. And if our European societies, so attractive to millions of refu refugees, are to continue flourishing, they need to retain some sense of mutual regard between anonymous citizens, which means keeping inflows to levels that allow people to be absorbed into that hard-to-define thing called a national culture or way of life. So what do we know from the integration hub about what's actually happening as regards ethnic mixing in modern Britain? Well, um, the numbers, some of the numbers have been touched on already. Um, if you look just at, at England or England and Wales, um, there has been a, a pretty dramatic increase in the ethnic minority population in the last 20, 25 years. The minority population was only about 7% in the mid-90s, and it's now, if you just look at England anyway, now probably 22, 23%. Um, if you look at the UK as a whole, the numbers are, are, are smaller, the proportions are smaller, partly <coughs> because Scotland has, uh, Scotland and Northern Ireland have a, because they're so um, white, have a diluting effect. Um, barriers to integration are broadly of three kinds, factors such as poor education, limited grasp of English, and ignorance of cultural norms, which generally fade with time. Other barriers are resistance to integration from the minority itself and resistance to integration from the majority. Um, but integration, as Trevor said, it's, a, it's, it's not an instinctive thing, it's a learned behaviour, and it's not just something that, that happens. Um, different groups bring different attributes, cultural traits, and indeed strategies to the whole business of integration. Kerry Peach, one of the most eminent academics in the field, has described an Irish strategy, which is essentially one of assimilation, and a Jewish strategy, which is about combining upward mobility with strong retention of cultural traditions. Successful South Asians have emulated the Jewish strategy. So, before coming here today, I had a, a quick flick through the, the integration hub looking for, looking for the good stories uh, and also looking for the, the more worrying stories. So I'm just going to run through uh, some of the things that I think um, are, are evidence of, of the, the integration story working. Um, minutes left. Five, five minutes. minutes, yeah. Right. Uh, well, let me hurry up. Um, I mean, on the plus side, one very basic uh, fact, the majority of minority uh, Britons speak English and think of themselves as British, or indeed English, Scottish, Welsh. Um, there's been quite a significant growth of uh, mixed-race households. In England, it's one in eight households of more than one person has somebody of more than one ethnicity in it. Um, we've seen, as Omar pointed out, a decline, a gentle decline in the index of dissimilarity that, that, that 
concept invented by academics to, to measure um, residential um, clustering and, and dispersal. Um, there has been, uh, as, as Trevor pointed out, there's been uh, uh, great success uh, in terms of upward mobility for certain min minorities. And indeed, the, the, the higher proportion of ethnic minority Brits now go to university than white British um, people. And indeed, 10% uh, of Bangladeshi A-level students, is an interesting stat, 10% of Bangladeshi A-level students now go to Russell Group universities, which is exactly the same number as the white British. Um, indeed, a lot of the, um, a lot of the things that we, that we talk about on the, in, in the integration hub are now really what one might call glass ceiling issues uh, for minorities, which is itself um, a sign of progress, I think. Um, on the minor side, um, it's true there is um, the index of dissimilarity is declining. However, what that, the point that that misses, something that the academic Eric Kaufman has pointed out, is that what we're seeing is more mixing amongst ethnic minorities themselves and more separation between ethnic minorities taken as a whole and the white British taken as a whole. I and mean, just to give you one rather depressing statistic, uh, Eric Kaufman did a study of, uh, a ward study of the 2011 census in which he found 42%, I think it is, of visible minority Brits living, live in wards where the white British are a minority, in some cases a very small minority. And that figure had risen from only 25% in 2001. <clears throat> uh, as Trevor said, schools tend to be more segregated than the neighborhoods they serve. Uh, ethnic, uh, a majority of ethnic minority Brits now go to majority minority schools. Um, there are particular issues to do with, uh, as I said earlier, to do when you have high, con high levels of immigration and high concentrations, it's much easier to live separately. And there's a particular issue, I think, to do with, with short-term flows. I mean, this is obviously particularly associated with, with European immigration, Eastern European immigration. What do you do about people who really don't want to become part of the us, um, the, the people who one might call sort of commuter immigrants? Um, there's a whole issue of, of um, media, globalization, as I mentioned earlier, travel. It's so much easier to, remote, to retain contact with, with uh, countries of origin or ancestral <coughs> countries. Um, and, um, but but, but um, um, as this is a conference about um, Muslim integration or about, about integration um, um, in, a, in a Muslim context, I think it is worth just briefly addressing the question, is there a special issue um, with Muslim integration in Britain? I think the short answer to that is yes. The main Muslim groups in Britain, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Somali, tend to live more separately. They're more likely to speak a language other than English at home. They're least likely to marry out. Uh, women are much less likely to work than most other minority groups. And in the main, Muslims still cleave to traditional norms that diverge significantly from an increasingly liberal mainstream, especially when it comes to religious piety, sexuality, and gender roles. Uh, Islamic extremism has understandably provided the focus of most government thinking and talking about integration and segregation issues in recent months and years. But I think there are also some more positive signs here, uh, which suggest that Muslims are just taking a bit longer than, say, Hindu and Sikh South Asians to adapt to British society. Surveys, for example, tell us that, that most adult Muslims still agree with the proposition that men should go out to work and women should stay at home. But younger Muslim women now reject that view. Um, so the, kind of the, the processes of, uh, you know, of, a, of adaption um, are taking place. Um, uh, I've, I've got a, a brief section on what to do. How am I doing ta on time? Have I overrun? You've overrun. I have. All right. Well, in that case, uh, well, I'll raise those things in the questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> I, I'd now like to invite uh, Christopher Bagley from the University of Southampton, and he's going to address you on the meaning of integration in British and Dutch cultures. The topic which I want to talk to you about is a very big one. It's a 50-year review of two uh, countries, Britain and the Netherlands. I'm not going to speak to all of those issues. Uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Nader Al-Rafai, and I 
I have written a long paper, 12,000 words, which hopefully you will be able to access electronically uh, uh, if you want to follow up these issues. Now, I want to begin with a quotation from one of my intellectual heroes, Tarek Ramadan. Multicultural society is a fact. There is no uh, being for or against it. This basic truth must be highlighted before engaging in the debate over multiculturalism, integration, or citizenship. Whether we want it or not, our Western societies are culturally diverse, and means must be sought to bring greater harmony to the multicultural citizenship discussed by the philosopher Charles Taylor or the sociologist Tarek Madud. <coughs> now, the Dutch plural society existed uh, in an ideal form in up to about uh, 1975, and then the pillars of society which guaranteed the rights of different religious groups began to crumble. Uh, at the same time, British society developed a form of multicultural pluralism, and it was based on a, a principle set forth by a Home Secretary. Uh, uh, Trevor Phillips mentioned this, uh, largely to reject it, but I want to retain this, this model. And I'll quote it for you. Integration of different groups within society should be defined not as a flattening process of assimilation, but of equal opportunity accompanied by cultural diversity in an atmosphere of mutual tolerance. Now in this integration model, there is an implicit social contract, a mutual agreement between different cultural groups to, res to respect and uphold each other's rights and freedoms for cultural, religious, and linguistic integrity. In the uh, paper, we, we make uh, comments on a traditional Islamic society. The, the concept of pluralism uh, is uh, an Islamic concept comes from uh, the Quran uh, and Islamic societies practiced pluralism in that they guaranteed the rights of Jews and Christian minorities uh, and uh, on payment of a, of a basic income, income tax, uh, they, they were guaranteed their basic rights and freedoms uh, of religion. And furthermore, they didn't have to fight, uh, uh, they didn't have to serve in, in the <coughs> armed, armed forces. Christians, in contrast, have been profoundly intolerant of uh, religious minorities, Jews, and, and now uh, of Muslims. Uh, the Islamic minorities in Britain have been described as the new Jews, they are a scapegoated group uh, who uh, are now seen in highly irrational terms. The demands for integration are in fact demands for assimilation and assimilation at an inferior level. It means that they must give up their, their alien practices. It's a form of cultural oppression. Now, I want to move to the issues of education, uh, citizenship education uh, in British schools. Citizenship education is a national curriculum uh, uh, topic uh, which was introduced uh, <coughs> into British school curriculum in the year 2000. Uh, and uh, Dr. El Rafai and I evaluated uh, how this was working in 
uh, a sample of schools in the northwest of England, 10 schools, five of which were Muslim foundations, uh, so all the pupils there were, were, were Muslim, and, the, and five schools uh, in areas which had a high Muslim minority or m majority. And by means of a qualitative and quantitative study, uh, we evaluated how the pupils aged 14 to 16 were absorbing the messages of the citizenship education curriculum. And we found uh, that the pupils from Muslim homes were more likely to absorb the citizenship education messages than were the mainstream uh, students, which was uh, interesting and, and pleasing finding. I'll just quote you f from one of the interviews. Muslim, a Muslim student observed, a good citizen is someone who helps their community, people and the environment. He is someone who socializes with others and befriends others. A bad citizen would be someone who is reserved and doesn't take part in community activities. And we give many more of the quotations uh, and evaluations in, in, in the, the long paper. So what we're proposing is that not only do Muslim pupils absorb the messages of citizenship from the, cur the curriculum to a greater degree than mainstream students, they bring into the school a set of Islamic values uh, from their, 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 their family and their mosque, which make them particularly likely to follow a good citizen route. And if we look at the, the hadith of the Blessed Prophet, we can see where this, these values come from. So I'll, I'll quote you a, a well-known hadith. Charity is incumbent upon every human limb, every day upon which the sun rises, to bring about the reconciliation between two contestants is charity. Helping a person to mount his animal or to load his baggage onto it is charity. A good word is charity. To move obstacles in the street is charity. Smiling upon the face of your brother is charity. So what I'm arguing is that Islam as a culture <coughs> embodies uh, these values of good citizenship uh, which are inherent uh, uh, in being uh, a Muslim. We have five minutes. Thank you. Now I'll, I'll finish by another quote from uh, Tariq Ramadan. Muslim Westerners should think of themselves as gifts as well as questions to their fellow citizens. They are the gifts because they carry with them other prospects, other cultures, and other memories that are uh, a wealth which they nurture uh, in their own society and they offer to the societies in which they find themselves. They must be aware of and consider confidently what they are and in what, uh, and what, and in what they bring to Western societies. So, uh, Tariq Ramadan argues that uh, it's not simply a question of integration, not simply a question of fitting in. It's a question of being a Muslim. We have our own culture, which we're confident about, which we offer to our community in very positive ways as good citizens. Thank you.
Can I thank all the speakers on behalf of the uh, SOAS University? Um, we are very short of time, so I'm told that I can only take three questions. So if you put your hand up, if you've got a question, and if you want to address it to one of the speakers, please say who you would like to respond to the question. If you could stand up and identify yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Mohammed Amin, patron of Curriculum for Cohesion. My question is for Omar Khan, and it was about your slide, which talked about civic identification, and in particular, the way that different people and communities see the words British, English, and Scottish. And to what extent do different groups see these as racial identities or as civic identities? Um, that's, that's a very good question. I think it's a, a tough question. Um, Obviously, in Scotland, they've been trying to redefine Scottishness in civic terms, and they've been relatively explicit, the SNP, and they do have, as you, you probably know, some uh, Pakistani representatives, both MSPs. Uh, but I think that is the challenge, I think, for Englishness. I don't think it's inherent in any national identity that it must be ethnicized, but I do think that um, Britishness uh, has been useful for so many decades, partly because it already contains within it notions of positive and, and negative notions of history that go, belong and eth go beyond an ethnicized form. I, I remember giving a speech in Poland that basically saying you need to make Polishness more like Britishness, and the response, not unreasonably from the Polish audience was, well, it's a lot easier when Britishness already encompasses these multiple identities. But I don't think that means we uh, can't do the work on Englishness. I just think it means we probably have to be a bit more self-conscious about it. And I think that's, that does go against, I think, the way we normally think about these things, that we'll just muddle along and things will get better over time. And there is, I agree with David to an extent, that there's a natural process here. But I think the natural process might be too slow if we don't do something more proactive around uh, recalibrating Englishness. And as I say, I don't think it's a, ne a necessity, but I think if you look at the way ethnic minorities think about Englishness, they, black people, Asian people, Muslims are uncomfortable calling themselves English Muslims, English black, black English people. Thank you. Can we have the mic come down to here, to, to the gentleman with the poppy? <coughs> yeah. Do you mind standing up and identifying yourself? And who you'd like to answer your question. Thank you. Hello, I'm Philip Wood, and I'm at Aga Khan University Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations. And um, this is a question, I think, probably for Osama. Um, and I was struck by Trevor Phillips' comment that life chances and preferences need to be randomly related to race or religion. That's his definition of integration. And I was thinking, if integration involves a case of mutual trust and compromise, cultural exchange, I feel, and, and this draws on what all the speakers have said, this is probably best exemplified in marriage, especially marriage across the boundaries of religion or across the boundaries of ethnicity. So if we have an integrated Muslim <coughs> community, it's a community where lots of Muslims are married to non-Muslims and where their children choose their religion. Um, I've been reading the questions and answers of Ahmed ibn Hanbal and sort of histories of the um, the Shurut Umar, the um, uh, declarations on the behavior of non-Muslims in Abbasid Baghdad. And I was struck by how much of it seems to be about the prevention of creolization, the prevention of everyday cultural contacts. And so my, my question to Osama is, what jurisprudential change has there been? Has the engagement and involvement of Muslims in non-Muslim contexts changed the way they've been thinking about um, intermarriage, marriage with non-Muslims in, in terms of jurisprudence. Thank you very much for that. Um, in my long paper from the Middle Democracy, I, I give other examples from uh, that period where th there was this strong, almost you know, anti-Jewish and Christian approach. So, for example, basic rights were respected, but it's explicit in the text that uh, new churches and synagogues cannot be built. You know, uh, existing ones can be kept and repaired and all that kind of thing. These are serious issues which uh, uh, we need to address. When it comes to marriage, that's on the increase. I, I've, I've served as an imam for 30 years and I've been conducting nikahs, Islamic weddings for over 20 years. Over the last four or five years, 
uh, more than 90% of the nikahs I do now are interfaith marriages, um, where, where Muslims are marrying people who are not Muslim. I, I actually do very few Muslim couples now. And uh, the, the experience uh, changes things. I mean, Sister Batul al Toma runs a new Muslim project, ha has been doing so for 20 odd years, and she once said that about 50% of conversions, in her view, conversions to Islam were for marriage. And, and often the convert would become more royal than the queen, you know, more religious than the Muslim partner, if you like. But in other cases, they would leave <coughs> after many years and it would cause tension in the marriage uh, because the conversion was really for the sake of marriage and often not uh, out of genuine faith. Uh, Batul al Toma also was instrumental in getting an international fatwa um, issued by the European Council for Fatwa and Research and then endorsed by uh, individual scholars like Abdullah bin Bayyah and others again, which was something he was seeing often, middle-aged couples, British, white English, kind of Christian background, where the wife would convert to Islam. And traditional Muslims were telling her her, ma her marriage was now invalid, she had to leave her husband. And often she had several kids, uh, um, and it would break the entire family. And it was Sheikh Abdullah al-Judeh, who was based in Leeds, who actually did the research, and he, he says he thought, there was a simple answer, there's no way that this can be allowed, and, and the marriage would indeed be invalid. But he found, to his surprise, that uh, we have in the tradition, in the hadith, cases like this from the time of Sayyidina Omar and Ali and others, where they allowed that marriage to continue uh, for the sake of uh, the family unit, etc. And, and therefore, the European Council issued this fatwa that um, in, su in such a case, the, uh, the Muslim woman, who traditionally would not be allowed to marry a non-Muslim man, could indeed stay with her husband uh, because uh, you know, the maqasid come into play. The higher values are about... Uh, family values, love, compassion, and all the rest of it. So um, yeah, there's been uh, increasing movement there. The obvious next question is, can Muslim women marry non-Muslim men from the outset? Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, European Council, have asked them explicitly, and they say no. Uh, but uh, if, the, if the woman converts to Islam within an existing marriage, that's okay, but she cannot marry um, of her own accord. But I have spoken to other religious scholars, uh, jurists, in Britain, in the US, in France, uh, and across Europe, who actually do allow that kind of marriage as well, uh, based on the changing circumstances. So thank you for that. I agree it's an important social issue. I think that's a topic for another day. <laughs> I'll take my last question from the lady over there. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Rabia Malik. I'm a psychotherapist, and I do a lot of work with the Muslim community. Um, I, I found the discussion a little frustrating in terms of the superficiality in thinking about integration. And my comments really directed to Osama and David, because actually I think... Do you, do you have a question? Yeah, yeah, it, it is a question, yeah. right? Um, because I thought the examples you gave were quite telling or interesting. Um, because for me, the question of integration is interesting at the point of conflict or tension. And I think we've skirted over that a little bit. You, alluded, you both alluded to it partly when you mentioned the example of Easter Enders, where um, the, ca the actors playing the Muslim figures were all non-Muslims. I think that's very interesting. And also with the example of the English cricket team, because what you didn't mention was that one of the Muslim members of the English cricket team also was banned from wearing um, a band supporting Palestinians. And that was a real example, I think, of tension around integration. So I think we're skirting over some of those issues. I think both of those underlying things say something about the place of Muslims in British society. And I think one of the key things at the heart of this is that there's a real lack of recognition of Islam in a respectful way. And that is partly the reaction that you're seeing in Muslims because there's a lack of respect of Islam as actually having something to offer in terms of values or the quote that Chris referred to from Tariq Ramadan as a gift partly too. Um, and there's a reaction to that. And I think we've avoided some of those points of tension. David, shall I come to you first? Uh, sure. Um, yes, I mean, I think integration do does take place partly through conflict. And conflict is in many ways a good thing here. I mean, the, uh, the fact that um, second and third generation uh, minorities uh, you know, have a greater confidence and make greater claims on the society perhaps than, uh, than the first generation um, who feel more deferential and um, so you know, it's, you, know, you, you can see these patterns um, you know, 20 or 30 years after initial waves of immigration 
uh, of, of people from African and Caribbean <coughs> backgrounds, you get the Brixton riots. Uh, then another uh, 20, 30, 30 years later, you get um, riots in the northern mill towns with people mainly Pakistani background. I mean, you, uh, and these, uh, you know, these you, you might say, I mean, I hope we're not going to have another wave of riots, but um, you might say these are actually signs of, uh, signs of, uh, of, of positive things in some ways, signs of ma making a claim on society that the first generation felt inhibited about doing. Um, but, um, I mean, uh, well, I, mean, I, 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 I don't agree with what you say about um, you know, Islam being disrespected in British society. I don't think that is true at all. I think there is greater wariness towards the Muslim minority, um, which is itself obviously highly differentiated. I mean, there is, you know, there is no no Muslim in the abstract, everybody comes from particular places and it happens that most British Muslims, you know, unlike say France, tend to come from relatively poor parts of poor countries, um, particularly if you look at Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, Somalis, who make up perhaps 60, 65% of the British Muslim population and have, set, and have kind of have been the dominant um, sort of mark on, on British, the British Muslim community. Um, it, it's you know so it, it isn't surprising that you have these um, um, uh, the, the, you know the, this data that that points to you know relative poverty amongst Muslim groups. I mean it's to do with with history and where people come from and so on. And great strides are being made, I think. Um, uh, and, and one one interesting development um, is that Bangladeshis seem to be. Um, departing somewhat um, in terms of outcomes from <coughs> Pakistanis. Uh, in, uh, they have somewhat improved outcomes, in both uh, educationally and in terms of economic outcomes. Um, it's a pattern we've seen over the last five or ten years. And I think that it's partly because of a London effect, um, uh, uh, particularly in relation to education. London schools have been doing a lot better than elsewhere in the country. Bangladeshis are disproportionately found in London. I think it may also be to do with the fact that Pakistanis are still more likely to have transcontinental marriages. Uh, about, about half of Pakistani marriages involve bringing somebody in from Pakistan, uh, which, is, which you know, tends to be a break on, on the, the kind of natural integrative process. So, uh, I think, yeah, I think you know, it, it is happening. I think um, British society is, is much more open than it was. Um, there are obviously particular problems related to the, uh, the fact that, that, that Muslims tend to feature in the news you know, negatively um, because of terrorism, because of grooming and so on. Um, but also, as I said earlier, Muslims do tend to live somewhat more separately than other minority groups. Um, and I think that explains, to some extent, the greater wariness that the white British majority have towards Muslims than they do towards others. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that question, Rabia. Uh, yeah, I do apologize for not um, getting more to grips with some of the issues. That, you know, we, I, I could certainly talk about them, but uh, given the first panel session of a, a sensitive conference, I didn't want to uh, upset the cart too much. Oh, no, please do. Uh, oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, We're here for. Okay, thank you. Yeah. The um, on your specific question, I think these things uh, take time to, to to change, as 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 David has said. I remember growing up, you know, from a Pakistani family in London. Uh, the Asian media, for example, Asian programs on the BBC, the radio, were dominated by people of Indian background. Even the Pakistanis hugely outnumber Indians in this country, but in London, I think it's the other way around. And that's one of the reasons there's clearly a lot more Indian people uh, of, of Hindu background and, and Sikh background were getting into uh, the media, for example. And I think that uh, one of the legacies is EastEnders, uh, where you have the Muslim couple, uh, Muslim family, uh, largely played by people who are not Muslim, although there are one or two Muslim actors or actresses there also. But of course, there are changes. Citizen Khan, is, uh, the new season has started, played by a British Pakistani Adil Ray, very funny and very popular except among certain uh, British Pakistanis. Mm -hmm. And he says he, it, it was the number one complained about program uh, for a couple of uh, years by British Pakistani Muslims, uh, giving Adil Ray a, a lot of flack for, uh, uh, for engaging a bit of comedy, uh, et cetera, which I think uh, shows where we are. And finally, sometimes, as, as David said, um, we should avoid kind of a, a victimhood or looking for uh, victimhood where there, where there isn't. Jack Straw, whatever you think of him, he said years ago, Islam is a mainstream religion. I think all British leaders accept Islam as the mainstream religion in this country. 
And uh, the Moeen Ali case with the cricket, my understanding is he wasn't banned. There was a controversy around his free Gaza um, wristbands during last summer with the Gaza war and the test matches, but actually he wasn't banned, and the uh, England cricket team allowed him to, uh, to wear that. So is, is that the case? That's, my, that's my, certainly so, yeah. my understanding. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really sorry. I'm going to have to cut the Q&A slightly short because I...